what it's worth to you, I'm back. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the SEA Coaches Corner Presents Heroes and Traditions. And the joys of live streaming. If you hear dogs barking, that's because my family's away enjoying the Great Grand Canyon, and I have to keep an eye on them and an ear on them. So good luck with that, everybody. Um, welcome to the show. My co-host is His Grace Brennan, and uh, we've got uh, the second part of our um, exploratory review of the mid realm. Uh, part one was uh, just a delight to hear all the cool things that we heard. Then we have one returning guest from then. We have His Grace Duke, uh, Duke Dog. Duke Dog has won, uh, by my count, about 467 mid realm crowns <laughs> and um, has been a that mainstay. Maybe an undercount. <laughs> he has been a mainstay in both uh, the prowess and the direction and flavor and and just important history of the kingdom and we are thrilled to have him here welcome uh duke dog thanks very much uh it's an honor to be here thanks for having me back again you we quit last time just before my my heyday so i, I was I'm glad you asked me back it's great to have you we are Brennan, also thank, yeah sorry for it, man <laughs> all right we are also incredibly pleased to be joined this evening by Count William of Fairhaven. Uh, he joined the society roughly 40 uh, years ago uh, and uh, is a knight, a pelican, and uh, won his crown approximately five years ago. Um, good evening, William. Thank you so much for having me. I've been Excited, in the to have you, <laughs> Excited to be here. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we are... Uh, Quite pleased to welcome our guest, Sir Wigthane the Younger. Hopefully I said that correctly. Uh, Wigthane joined us uh, roughly 15 years ago and uh, was, let's see, knighted by Ron Valder and Arabel Arabella. Excuse me. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I miswrote it, so <laughs> you got it right. All right. Welcome, gents. How are you? Great. Good. Fantastic. So when last we streamed to you, our fine audience, um, the goal was to get at least halfway through the 90s. And I don't think I don't think we even got a chance to dip our toes in. So we're just going to kind of uh, reset and start at the 90s. And um, I think we flashed this graphic the last time, but we'll bring it back uh so the Dukes from the 90s uh, were Komar, Dog, Finn, Thorbjorn, Osis, which we'll just say Osis, and uh, His Grace Edmund. So they all were uh, brought into their duchies during this period. Uh, so why don't we start there? Someone other than dog, you can, you can talk a little bit, but uh, someone other than dog, well, William, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, this is a period you, I think, when did you get started around? It was also, it was before this. And then you were through this period, right? Yeah. I joined the SCA in 1981. I was 15 and I went to my first fight practice and fought Duke Andrew of seldom rest. So that ruined me for everything. No, it was great. Uh, but so Komar was my night. And uh, he along, and I, I want to just give a little credit to Tadashi, but Tadashi kind of started the big run of knights. More knights were made in the Middle Kingdom in the era of the 90s than in any other decade for the kingdom. And uh, Duke Dog won his first crown there in 90. That was Komar and Lisa's crown tourney in Dayton. They had to fight on the lawn in the rain because the tourney went so long. I think it had about 90 combatants. 
uh, near, nearing 100 back in the no, day, but we also it, had... Actually, 106. 106. And uh, so there was kind of a, a I don't want to say it, there was, a, there was a lot of people who came of age like myself in the rain that I was knighted in 94 by Finn and Garland in their second rain, they made nine knights. That was unheard of to make that kind of a quantity of knights in a single rain. That was a lot. Anybody want to jump? Yeah, jump in, dog. I don't want to well, just the, monopolize this. I, I know a lot about it, but you, I don't remember if we if we touched on this in the previous episode where traditions up to this point really were kind of one peer per order per reign. Right. So you were basically getting two knights, two laurels and two pelicans a year up until this point. You know, there were a couple there were some outliers, you know, one or two outstanding individuals who, who shouldn't have been passed up and, and like that. But but that was kind of traditional rate of peerage before that point. And it was too slow. It was really a really a silly kind of tradition to adhere to at the time. So was it yeah, legitimately it goes something out, that was done out the I mean, window? Did did kind of crowns get kind of counseled as they were coming in? You know, we only really do, you know, one one peerage. I mean, or I mean, or was it just something that was done and it felt like it was tradition? More more like that. If more I could like just it felt if, like a tradition. And and honestly, the metrics, the seventies was definitely that way, where you'd see one or two, maybe not even three peers made in a rain, and. As the 80s came on, they were making, you know, you were seeing numbers like, you know, I don't know, uh, what does my table say? Eight, eight peers, 10 peers of rain, but you get to the 90s and you have the most populous rains, a quantity of peers ever made in the history of this kingdom all fall in the mid 90s. Uh, Finn and Garlanda made 30 peers in their summer rain in 1994. Osis and Val Fiona in 95, right in the center, made 35 peers and, uh, the uh, the following reign, thirty two peers, uh, which was Edmund and Kate. I mean, you just but then it dips way down, kind of returns to those eighties numbers, ten, twelve, nine, eight, and it bounces around for a while in there, uh, and then it sort of levels back off. But a lot of that, you know, Comar and Lisa made uh, they made eighteen peers in their reign in nineteen ninety. And that was just ridiculously unheard of. And then uh, who followed David and Chang? Go ahead. Oh, well, and and when I stepped up after Komar and Lisa, the decks were completely cleared. I had really nearly no one to to elevate in my, in my range. But, you know, if we're talking about legends, you elevated somebody really important in your first reign. You elevated Forgan, who went on to found one of the... the greatest households certainly in our kingdom but known throughout the society house dark yard that's a big deal and komar wanted to do it and i talked him into waiting until my coronation because it was in his local group and the coronation ceremony was at the church where they held their local practice so i knew everyone he knew would be at that event so yeah true true he would have been komar would have done him if i hadn't practically begged to just just wait until my coronation and we'll do it there nowadays i think the outgoing king would do it just because just because you know back then it was more of a the the day was the day belonged to the incoming king and queen and that i i think we lose that a little bit nowadays the outgoing court is a big deal but so Don't thinking about it. thinking about the balance you were having at that time, Doug, you said it sort of uh, you came into a, a, an empty deck. I think was the phrase you used. Was it just sort of a natural course correction that you had this glut of folks that had needed recognition, and then they all got recognized, and then okay, we're back to a place where. Um, where we don't have this huge backlog of folks that need it? Or was there some sort of conscious uh, correction where we're gonna, no, we've done too many almost. Let's, let's course correct. Um, well, William was actually part, 
closer to Komar's reign even than I was as his prince. But uh, I think there was, I think this is a this in my opinion only, and I don't ha really have any facts or testimony to back it up. But Komar's knighting came much later than it was deserved, and I I think there was a, a little bit of resentment harbored there, so that when he stepped up, it was like the dam's bust. You know, we're sorry, we're. Anybody that gets close is going to get it. That's there's no, he was not going to drag his feet on anybody. It was just going to be, you know, the, the, the gates are open and anybody that's there is not going to wait. So I say that's pretty accurate. So yeah, one of the know, questions, it, go ahead. One Sorry. of the questions we've gotten in chat was uh, how many knights are in these reigns? Is it sort of, a third of these peers or is it uh i'm not sure by what metric by decade i yeah, have the numbers you, you, uh, well you were talking about uh there's 35 38 is it is it that all how many nights rising tide, rising tide lift, did all peerages yeah um so i'll throw some stats at you across uh some of these range so what you were seeing, like Dog said, even by one or two in a rain, and then you hit, you hit, Komar and Lisa made four in their first rain, and they made uh, seven in their second rain, but you have a couple of nines in there. Finn and Garlanda uh, made nine, and they made some important shiv. Uh, they made Branus, who reigned. You know, kind of how I look at it from a, just from a statistics kind of thing. But we have three reigns in the 90s where there were nine chivalry elevated in one reign. Six, four, five, five, six, six. But there are these big spikes on the table. And uh, and those were those were big reigns. Uh, Finn and Garlanda, Tarquin and Aveline, and Ronvalder and Arabella. If you've got those are the big hitters. For my own for my own edification, I mean you've got my if you got all the stats there, what was my kind of average? Because it feels like in all the peerages, I was still down in the two or three reign per per uh, order. Let's look. Well, if we uh, if we go to the great, uh, what am I looking for here? I'm sorry. Talk amongst yourselves while I <laughs> get that. Some of these I so don't have. Those... I have activity by reigns, but I'm looking for. I know I built that stat somewhere. Let me ask a question while you're looking that up. Um, so I, from the time that I joined in Meridies, you know, looking north at the mid realm, we always, we always thought of the mid as being just a, a really large kingdom. And we know that that's true during the nineties geographically. I mean, you guys are still, you know, you, you've started to split off a little bit, but you're still just, I mean, from corner to corner. I mean, it feels like it takes, 24 hours to drive the length of your kingdom at this point but but size wise though as well um populace wise how i mean it felt like you're still a really large kingdom uh during the 90s for sure is oh, that yeah. is that true so they yeah the metric here here's the metric because i i got into an argument with a kaiden count who was complaining about something that we weren't doing as an order like we could do it as an order the kingdom was 36 hours east to west and 39 hours north to south. <laughs> Nonstop drive. Yeah. Dragons yeah. crossing the Thunder Bay and East Watch to uh, Minot or yeah. Castel Rouge. Minot to Dayton was, or sorry, Castel Rouge to Dayton was 29 hour drive. Plus an international border. Right. Right. <laughs> so, of course, back then you could just show you, you, it was very different. You could just show your driver's license and. Yeah. We went to Canada all the time because it was very easy, but, but you know, all, nights got made from some of those, some of those places. Go ahead. Go ahead. Win. Oh okay. yeah. You're great. So I was just going to let you know, um, cause I've got the, the metrics too. And I took a look at it and you're for you. I mean, the average is like two, yeah, uh, two okay. nights per rain. So there were some range you did three, some range you did one, but I mean, it averaged out to two. And I'm probably the same for the other orders as well, but. But okay, you know, was probably just, a combination of your very traditional and picky. 
but the thing is i act i act almost stri- well i act strictly on the the polling and the wishes of the yeah. order i mean it's and and i get teased sometimes i don't remember everybody i've knighted i mean and it's not because i've knighted so many it's because it's not that much to do with me i'm just i'm i'm a i'm a tool i'm a mechanism for getting people elevated as king that's all so that i don't feel any personal cachet in who i elevate and so it it doesn't stick in my mind that i i did this person's elevation i did that person's elevation you know a few stand out because they were important sort of historically to me and the individual that there was some something there but and or or i didn't get to do (laughs) for a couple a couple of situations but yeah so i don't know that i'm stingy i'm just pretty <laughs> invented uh, as a joke <laughs> i know i well yeah but you know it's it's a good point it's a good point to bring up because i think that there are kings who do feel that they get some cachet from how many people they elevate and so I, something I, else I and don't go ahead william good I would say a neat footnote of the 90s as well that might uh, folks listening might find interesting is it was the first time in the history of our kingdom that there were some nights made when the king was not there. The queen made some nights where the prince hand on the sword. Uh, some of it was just circumstance. In one case, we didn't have a king and uh, the prince uh, who was uh, Edmund or oftentimes said, so I know it's more common in other kingdoms that the knight uh, of the candidate being elevated might be the one to put their hand on the sword. That's a little less common in the mid, but the uh, there are six six members of the chivalry were elevated by queens. Four of them were in the nineties. It was the first time it had ever been done. Hmm. That, so, well, I was Kenneth Prince, and I don't remember who who got knighted there. That if if I was involved in that ceremony or not. I don't think so. I can tell you, but there are, there are six. And if I go down to Kenna, oh, well, it'll be under Jafar. I to get my filters. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, it's like, I know Edmund did, uh, did a couple and I know who was uh, Jafar and Catherine's prince. Cause Catherine was one of them. I was, I you was. were, you weren't the one who put the hand on the sword for Talbot McTaggart. I don't recall. That's why I'm asking. I don't recall well, ever doing that. But so, yeah, okay. so I know you guys, are, you know, kind of. I don't want to say you're getting bogged down, but you've got yeah. because you've got Moving metrics on. and statistics, it's easy to look at. But you know, you 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 mentioned a name that I would like for you guys to talk about, uh, and that's Jafar. And for those of you who aren't familiar with mid realm history, he won his second crown list, and before he got a chance to step up, he passed away. And um, and then uh, his consort Kenna reigned uh, reigned by herself through the reign. I was. Uh, I was a crown when he passed away. It was my first crown uh, in Meridies, and it, it just—it was devastating. I remember when Palomar sent me the message that, uh, you know, that first—I mean, first we were going through that he was sick, and you know, we went through the days of that, and then he passed. But just I can tell you, as a young guy coming up, and then you know, maybe you know, I, I certainly wasn't on the peer level, but uh, you know, because I was still on my way up. Uh, man, Jafar was an amazing, dynamic fighter from. You know, when I was a squire, from that perspective, and 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 was just really neat. And so, I'd love to hear you guys talk a little bit about him as a fighter and a man. Uh, uh, you know, because you, you knew him. I'll tell you a quick unbelt story, real short. So Jafar was best friends with Sir uh, Osmundus, who is a knight that came up with me living in Flaming Griffin, and so we saw Jafar a lot over here, two hours away from Indy. We saw Jafar a lot. And Jafar was a guy I was looking up the hill at, you know, I was an unbelt going, that guy's out at the head of the pack, but he didn't fight in the 1990 crown tournament in Dayton and I couldn't understand it. And I asked him, I said, why aren't you fighting in this tournament? You could, you could really move your knighthood, your possibility. And he said, well, I don't really want to be king. And I could probably knock out a bunch of people who really do want to be king. And that just wouldn't be right. 
And man, that was like getting hit with a 10 pound hammer directly on in the face. And it that changed how I thought about it. I didn't fight in crown for two more years. Two, yeah, two more years. That was the kind of person Jafar was. I got the call at 2 a.m. Oz called me. He said Jafar died. I put on a suit. Oz picked me up an hour later. We drove to Indianapolis. We got there at six in the morning. That was one of the hardest funerals I've ever been to in my life. He was 29 years old, younger than me. So, yeah, he was, man, he was an somebody excellent. Else talk. I don't even want he, was, to... he was an excellent man. Just, I mean, a great sense of humor, a, a, a visible, palpable sense of honor on the field. Um, Palomar and I kind of came up together and Jafar, Jafar was, Jafar and I fought in the finals when I won my second tournament. Jafar was my prince. Uh, I was there at the hospital when, when he passed away. Uh, it was the fight was you had the whole kingdom. The fight you two had, the two-stick fight at the Crown in Indy, was one of the great fights in the history of the Middle Kingdom. It was two guys at the absolute peak of their ability. The whole tournament stopped when you and when you and Jafar fought. It was uh, it was, was astonishing. Long, was long... Yeah. And he won. He won. That was a semifinal bout, and he semifinal. He, he won that. That was his. He won that crown. It was and yeah. no, the Indy Crown. Osis won that crown. No, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're right. I got the crowns mixed. Yeah. He went yeah, on right. to win that crown, but the best fight in the whole tourney that everybody, <laughs> I mean, literally everybody stopped. There were other people fighting and nobody paid him any attention because it was but, just amazing. Yeah. But that was like a 15 minute fight or something too. It was for a two weapon fight. It was incredibly it'll, long. It'll be out on video shortly. I just got all the digitized <laughs> transfers. I think, I think that one, William is already out there on video. Um, Cause that was one of the ones that kicked it out there. Um, and just as a guy that came up in the mid 2000s, you know, starting the SCA, I can tell you Jafar's name was on everyone's tongue still, you know, 10 years after he had passed. And even today, you know, in 2022, his name still continues to get brought up. He's well regarded, even going back and watching the fights that he had back in the, the mid 90s. I know a number of uh, new knights and unbelts have watched those videos and just were like wow what what did we miss you know in the, the caliber of fight that he was um just watching him swing because that's back when you guys were using like 40 inch swords and things like that you know everything was like <laughs> nerf footballs long. for thrusting tips right uh. <laughs> and and he was just able to whip them around with such elegance and boys i yeah i'm gonna go back and watch the video again but after this <laughs> When he was when he was Prince, we took him to Scrailing All Thing, which is the group in Ottawa, Ontario, 15 hour drive from Dayton. Um, Countess Katja came down from uh, Fort Wayne and picked him up and they came to our house. And we went out there and we didn't have enough room. So he was the prince. So we didn't take our armor. But he goes out there and he's fighting pickups at the Coronet Tourney in Eldemir. And all he's using is a, a hand buckler like the size of a drink coaster and a sword. And he's whomping everybody. And one of the knights came out who was left hand and had this big shield. And Jafar said, oh, hang on a sec. And like, there was this kind of smirk and ah, well, you know. And so all Jafar did was he took off this little buckler, put it on his other hand and went left handed with a drink coaster <laughs> and stomped the bejesus out of a member of the chivalry who, who's a good fighter. Um, that was when we all went up to Ottawa. Dog was king. You and Ilsa, second second reign, 93. But uh, Jafar well, just, he was like, who can, who can do that? I have uh, one more question, sort of, uh, you know, it's uh, Jafar adjacent, uh, and it's for his grace dog. Uh, so on that reign that Kenna did, uh, Meridias fought as allies, a number of other kingdoms fought as allies at that Penzik. And I remember thinking then, and I never really got a chance to ask this question. And now it's decades later, and I've been wanting to ask this question forever because we were allies and I have never fought harder. I have never wanted to fight harder. And I, I mean, I felt this connection because we were fighting for Kenna and our battle cry was Jafar and, uh, you know, and, just looking at your kingdom, you know, as an outsider looking in, it looked like 
the rain was this coalescing moment where it really brought the kingdom together as one large family. And maybe, you know, off and on, because you've got so many different regions and so, you know, it's a large kingdom and everything. And, and sometimes things felt a little fractious, but that was a, just a catalyzing moment of bringing, bringing everybody together. And, you know, looking in, that's what it looked like. What was it when you were there? Well, um, that was a very strange Penzik. A lot of things happened there if you if you were there as an ally and you you recall. But as far as the kingdom was concerned, everybody liked Jafar. I mean, he was like I said, he was a good man, um, honorable fighter, great sense of humor. I mean, he was he, he was just fun to be around. Humble and I mean, Palomar said when we were talking about him uh before just before he was elevated in in a chivalry meeting and I'm, I'm giving a little away here but um his when he first started coming to the attention of the order palomar his his knight said that his prowess wasn't there yet but if there was an award for being a good human being he'd have it and that was that i, I can't say any better than that he was he really just just was that good a guy now it was also kind of the the um, the the young celebrity, and I don't want to like I say I, I love Jafar. Everybody speaks well of Jafar, and I and I do too. But there's also a certain amount of he wasn't around long enough to develop anything but a good reputation. Yeah, you know, I this is just a phenomenon. He he, you know, a couple of rains, you're gonna make a couple of people upset it just some people are going to be upset by something you do in a rain whether it's great for the rest of the kingdom or not palomar or i mean sorry jafar had one rain it was a great rain everybody loves the first timer and and his his rain was was terrific you know and he never got a second rain so he he never really he was he was never burdened with the mistakes of a second rain <laughs> but but it was it was a tragedy the entire kingdom did feel feel that loss the that person who was just cresting in their their prowess and their reputation and to be taken away so quickly and so um unexpectedly it, it just hit everybody really hard well thank you guys it's so much for sharing oh i, I we need to kind of move just, on a little bit, but I, uh, I, just, I, his, I just wanted yeah, to say thank you for okay. sharing. I know I, I didn't want to open wounds, but I mean, I, I, I just don't think we can discuss the history of the mid realm in this period without, without you yeah. know, really looking at the Jafar reign and then the Kenna reign. So I'm going to try and totally switch gears and there's no easy way to come out of talking <laughs> about a, a man like that. Um, but we've talked a little bit about how um, there was this huge influx of, of knights in the 90s. And one of the things that I find really interesting is, is training in, turn, uh, not tournament, but training in practice culture. So what did that do, uh, this influx of knights? How did that impact the way that y'all trained through this time? Or did it? I would oh, say it, am it amped it up. A lot. We, one thing that was very different about the 90s knights as a group, I mean, you know, we're all knights on this. And so you, there weren't any really, the, the 90s knights, especially, you know, we all came off of unbelted champions together. That was kind of a new experience. So we were all friends. We weren't fighting in the shiv meetings and uh, we, we all trained together and there was a lot of trooping around. I would say travel was one thing you had one with so many more knights really we had all traveled a lot as unbelts and we continued that travel as knights and uh and we were all friendly so we were all into helping each other squires and students and anybody who wanted to duke finn and i trooped around in the 90s just going to collegium events to teach fighting in general because like we now had the license to do it i think there may be a cultural thing in the mid realm that some other kingdoms um we've our kingdom is built very 
consciously around groups, shires, baronies, not around, not so much around uh, households and personalities. And there's, that's always going to be a factor, but our training and our, our, you know, troop disposition and who we fight with and who we want to learn from and all that stuff really is based in geography, not personality. So, you know, there's always going to be, you know, we, we talked about this in the eighties that in, in Indiana, there was moon wolf and in uh, Ohio, there was Laurel and Comar and um, Michigan back in the eighties was uh, some of the Northwoods nights, so to speak. So we've always, we've always been sort of geographically centered in our training. So there was never, we didn't have, you know, like private practices or household practices so much yet. So traveling around and going to other people's practices was just, was just a common thing. Am I right, William, about that? That's, yeah. All, you know, Comar, Talmar, all practices were open. Anybody could come. And we would go visit other practices. I came up to Michigan for quite a few. Yeah. You know, we, we, we didn't, there, there was this little bit of division in kind of Ohio and Indiana. We kind of called it the rattan curtain, like people from <laughs> Ohio didn't go to Indiana. But when you look at how Indiana's kind of distributed, it was the geography thing that most of the groups are in the west part and they're closer to the groups in Illinois. And a lot of the big populous groups in the Ohio and Kentucky area are in the east part. So I could go two and a half hours to Indy or I can go an hour to Columbus. And so it took a while, but a lot of us still made those troops, you know, the unbelts touring around the pro tour, all the guys that got knighted, we all hit the same big circuit attorneys, which I think is common. Every kingdom has something like that but we all trained together. Everybody did. And, and as you were saying, Alan, on earlier that travel, it, travel is traditional for us, really. I mean, back, back in the eighties and nineties, when, you know, for us, <coughs> we traveling to events was just what you had to do. So, you know, three hours, three hours, eh, that's right on the edge of a day trip. You might, if it's a three hour trip, you might stay Saturday night and come home Sunday outside of three hours, the three hour to six hour window. It's like, okay, I got to go out Friday night so that I can get up and be at the tournament in time and then stay Saturday and drive back Sunday. But then you get into the fringes of the kingdom where six, six to 11 hours is kind of what you can do on a weekend without taking a day off. Yeah. And, but, and beyond that, you're taking a Friday off to go to an event oh, in yeah. Minnesota or something. So and we used to, we used to go to Nordsko. So the group in Minneapolis called Nordskog and, and they hosted one of the biggest tournaments in the kingdom. And it was on what we called the pro circuit. And if you wanted to be anybody, you went to the Nordskog and Orlo tournament. That's 12 hours one way. Plus back then, and it is now, but we have less regions, but the regions got crowns and coronations. And so I, when I was Earl Marshall in 96, 95, 96, 97, there was a Curia in Minneapolis on the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. And it was Kenna's, that was Kenna's reign. And she said, we're having Curia. So, okay, you know, we'll jump in the car and <laughs> drive 12 hours. I had to go there for the crown anyways, but, you know, we didn't think that much of it. Yeah. Like, like dog says six hours. You could do that after you could do that after work. Yeah. On a Friday, get in around 11 <laughs> midnight. If you stop for dinner, you know, you hit the hotel, uh, you got eight people in the room. You, you all get up piling the cars. It's how things are yeah. done. <laughs> all right. So I think we're going to transition to my favorite part. Who won the decade? So we're still in the nineties. Uh, and I am going to start uh with uh william william thinking when, about what's, fighting when you say who okay go ahead uh when you think about fighting in the 1990s uh who won the decade and this can be who was the greatest fighter of the era who had the greatest impact just whatever metric you decide to apply who won the decade mm. 
who won? Man, that's a tough question. Um, you know, because Dog had some reigns in there and then had more as time went on. Uh, Edmund had a bunch of reigns in the 90s. Um, but, you know, I think if I was to pick one person who really rose up, and I mean, I've served on many reigns as such, but the, the person who went from kind of one of the pack to way past was Bronis. In the 90s, he came out and then he won his crown at the uh, uh, 95. Um, he, was, he followed Finn and Garland's second reign where I was knighted. He was knighted by Finn and Garland in the first reign. But Bronis really jumped in a course. I mean, sadly, in there, Forgan passes away. And who's the senior guy in the household? You know? And because uh, Rongvalder doesn't get knighted till 97. And so I'm, I'm going to pick uh, Bronis. Dog? That's hard. It's hard for me to think in terms of the, the best guy. Again, because we're so big, we have so many fighters who are fighting within their regions and travel outside the regions and, and just remember Ron, your grace that our, our accounting office of uh, Ernst and Young is not going to show up and say you had a bad answer. <laughs> you can have multiple <laughs> answers here. You can Cer say I refuse to answer. I mean, there's no winning or losing here. This is for fun. Yeah. Certainly Bronis is a, is a standout. Like William said from like fighting in his first crown. And then I think, Two and a half, three years later, he won, wins crown. Um, um, there were some guys who were out in North Shield who remained, became, are still standouts there if they haven't retired by now. Um, but yeah, I, I've got I've to gotta kind of agree with William that as far as who, who burst on the scene and stayed at the top of his game, all through that decade, it, it, it Bronis is certainly up there. All right, Wigstein, you get the fun answer because you weren't around for for this. Am I correct? So it's yeah, uh, yeah, no. So I, you're I only know through stories. Yeah, by reputation, who wins the nineties? <laughs> oh, by reputation, uh, I mean for me, it's it's kind of a toss up because like Bronis is the one that I knew about before I even started the SCA. So he this. He, he transcended the SCA. Um, him and Karayadoc were the two guys that I knew about from my days of doing foam fighting back in the 90s. So that's who I remember. But once I got in and started seeing more people and starting hearing things within the SCA, uh, Dog and Edmund popped up. And Dog was actually my first king when I started. So uh, I was like, here's a guy who's been winning you know, for the past two decades. I was like, Oh my God, that was, that was pretty impressive. And then Edmund on the other hand was another guy who was winning for now he's going into like three decades of winning crown tournaments. So, you know, these, these were like kind of two of the pillars that I saw. And then Bronos was this like training, you know, just martial artist pillar as well. Thank Great. you, gentlemen. Yeah, that's always, that's always a lot of fun. And again, there are no right and wrong answers here. It's just kind of, you know, kind of what your impressions are from that, from that period. So we're going to jump into the 2000s and cue uh, some Radiohead music. Uh, and then we're going <laughs> to, um, you know, go for, let's see. The Dukes from the 2000s, uh, as per my uh, study, uh, Ron Valder and Branos. Uh, both became Dukes during this decade. Uh, Felix the Just and Bardolph. Uh, so that's that's who I read through there. And you know, I know, you know, I've got to fight all four of those, so that's at least fun. You know, I don't think I fought everyone from the previous decade, but uh, I definitely fought all of those guys. And uh, you know, this is a, a rich period. You may have only had. Four four dukes made but i mean that's a lot of times because dog was winning and edmund was winning and uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunity i think for a lot of other folks um but this is a really rich growth period i think for pure tourney prowess um i mean you guys were really cranking it up i remember you know 
the the bar that I was setting, you know, was like, okay, I got to get up to an, another mid realm event. I got to get up to Candlemas. I got to get, I got to make sure I'm doing the pickups at, at, uh, you know, we had a, a, a war called border raids between Meridia's and, and the middle. And I know it wasn't a big deal for you guys, but it was a huge deal for us. And as much as anything, I wanted the pickups after the battles were done uh, because this is where I was measuring myself. And a lot of the other Meridian Knights were really, we were looking, you know, at the high end of the mid realm Knights and the mid realm prowess and, and, you know, was like, okay, this is what they're doing now. Okay. This is what they're doing now. And so it was a great period for us to learn. Uh, so it had to have been a great period for you guys. Uh, and I really feel like just overall the prowess of the kingdom, probably in the SCA made huge jumps, uh, during this decade. Your guys' thoughts? Well, I was going to say, Border Raids was a big deal for Oaken. Yeah. Right. Because we were close to Meridiers. So you always got all the Oaken people, Ohio and Kentucky, and you got the Southern Indiana folks. But there was a big war event, not a war event, uh, a big melee fighting event that was held at this place called Jubilee Old English Fair in Northern Illinois. And it drew a lot of folks from Northern Indiana into that. And so like one year, I always wanted to go to Jubilee because Duke Con McNeil was there and I wanted to get some pickups with him. And I was like branded almost a traitor to my region for not going to board raids one year. I'd been like 25 years and that was all shot to heck. So it was important to us. We love coming down. That's how I, that's how I met John the Bear Killer and John the Mad Celt and all those people from Radiators. That's how we got to know them at Border Raids. Doug, your thoughts? Well, I I attended Border Raids. I've probably gone to Border Raids, um, I don't know, half a dozen, ten times because it's it's a ten hour trip for me. Um, I've gone when I was king, when I was prince. Uh, always a good time. One of the hottest melee events I've ever been to was a Border Raids. Um, that was, uh, actually Eliyahu was King at that time. Um, probably my first border raids, I think uh, right around Penza 13. <laughs> Yikes. Um, at, at old yeah, Jellystone. Long before your time, long your time, young man. <laughs> yeah. But I was knighted in 95 and it was 107 degrees in the shade and it was 99% humidity. And we fought one battle and then said, let's call it a draw. <laughs> well the time this is a great story when i the time i was down there with eliahu it was like that it was like 106 in the shade and 95 humidity and it was it was just stupid hot and we were all too young and too stupid to get out of the sun but at one point we'd fought a battle and as as things do when it gets a little hot tempers were rising a little bit and think guys were hitting a little too hard maybe so they called a hold and they put, they made everybody go and sit in the shade, sit down in the shade of these trees alongside the battlefield. And one night, and I, I do not know his name, stood up and in his best Meridian accent said, look, y'all are fighting like it's us versus them. He says, and he, we're all us. <laughs> them are the guys who are sitting at home watching football with a beer on their stomach. And, you know, that, that hit home, although a lot of us looked around going, you know, sitting at home with a beer on my stomach feels kind of, would be kind of good right now. But, uh, but it really, that made a, a huge impression on me in my early days of the SCA and, and how the fact that we are all us. Yeah. Was, uh, with a, regard to add, the uh, one thing we, oh, I just, the one thing about border raids that was different than any other war was we were friends with the Meridians. Uh, that's more than likely true. I, I don't, I can only remember not fighting with the middle, like maybe twice the whole time I went to Penzik. So, I mean, we, it was more of it, even though I, I'm, I, I really, I'd heard from other people that you guys saw it as a bit of a training exercise. You were just getting a warm up for Penzik where it was our big deal war uh, until Gulf Wars. And even then Gulf Wars didn't become a big deal for us because, you know, we wound up having to host it uh, for, for a, you know, the first couple of decades of it and split our forces to try to make sides even. Um, the, the big question that I had was really less about border raids and more about, maybe it was just my own personal observation. And I thought 
uh, prowess was spiking, but it really felt like the 2000s, this decade, uh, training became a little more consistent. It was easier for a new fighter to kind of get competent much faster because of how much the training had improved the previous decades to the point that we were, you know, I mean, we weren't quite in the period where we are now where, heck, you can just go to YouTube and, and actually learn some of the most important fundamentals. You know, you don't, you don't have to go to a practice. Uh, but I mean, during the 2000s, it really felt like overall prowess just took a leap, you know, well, for across the board. You're great. So I, I think the there's a lot to be said there about the, the learning digitally, because in the 2000s, when I started, uh, there were things like podcasts like Pain Bank, where I heard about great dukes all throughout the known world, um, you know, talking about how they came up to to be what they were and how they trained. Um, I remember the Mid Realm site had a, a, like a video section that you could go watch. You could watch Count Williams videos. You could watch at that time, uh, Jarl Branos' videos on training and like going through this like methodology that I had never seen before. Um, it, it all made sense and I was, and it started to kind of, I could hear the roots from different martial arts and different sports being used as analogies for fighting, you know, the, the boxing stance, you know, throwing, you know, pushing with your hips, things like that. And it was just, it was incredible for me because as I came in, as uh, this guy from another game, I was like, oh, I'm a, I'm a big badass from my other game. I'm going to come here. And I got the crap beat out of me my first practice. My wife will tell you a story about how I came back from practice. Giddy as a little schoolgirl because I got the crap beat out of me and showing all the bruises and everything else like that. But it was just like, it was incredible to see that. And then as I started to, to develop in the mid 2000s towards the end of the 2000s, I still didn't feel like I was there even with all my previous experience and stuff like that, because the training was moving so fast and the development of the skill at that time was so fast. It was really incredible just to kind of be at the ground floor watching it build up. Something that catalyzed that, like a watershed moment. We had a knight who, when he left our kingdom, he was not a knight. He went to Drakenwald. He was deployed in Desert, Desert Shield. And then he got knighted over there and he came back. And in the late 90s and early, it was like right at 2000 he asked a bunch of us to do a 20 minute segment six nights on a tape on a videotape called sparring with the chivalry he wanted to send it to his friends in Drakenwald because they were so geographically dispersed so we all pitched in it was uh, sir miles blackheath and we did the tape but then like people were asking about the tape because they had got copies of it from their friends in Drakenwald and it was like, it was just like a kind of a moment that we could start doing some of those things. And the College of Martial Arts, the Middle Kingdom came along. And, but that was a, that was like that watershed moment where somebody actually put it on a medium that you could see. Here's how Duke Komar fights Sword and Shield. There you go. It was also, I think, in the 2000s, Bronis's reign um, was the advent of the tournaments of chivalry in the middle a big that's a big thing for us now um and that was originally the inception from that for that was that talking about crown tournaments we had an invitational crown tournament for years and years and years and we had we had done a lot of pr around crown in about how you don't fight unless you plan to win don't fight unless you're ready to win because it's a job it's work it's hard work it's really tough and i think we oversold that part of it um and uh we were getting the crowns were getting smaller because people were intimidated to even go fight. Um, so Bronis opened up crown tournament to say, no, he wasn't, he wasn't going to send out invitations. Anyone who wanted to fight in crown tournament could, but it's a job. Be prepared. Don't fight unless you want to win, unless you're planning to win, unless you're training to win and all that. And what he, what had been happening was people were showing up to crown, unbelts were showing up to crown tournament just to be seen. They had, were not prepared and had no real strong intention of winning. So he opened up crown tournament and said, don't come unless you really want to be king. And then we had a tournament of chivalry, which is where everyone was, all the unbelts were encouraged to go 
to show off and learn stuff. So it's, it's become this big training thing. We got all the Knights are out on the field. It's a big pickup day and all the chivalry out on the field and the undoubts line up one after another and come out and fight us without a, and we, we have breaks now during the day. It's, it's evolved a little bit over time. Um, but, but I think that might be um, an aspect of this, the, the, the flowering of training is that you've got a bunch of nights in one place and you've got hundreds of unbelts going to that place to learn from all these nights and then going back to their local groups. So can you speak just for the totally uneducated, what is that? Because I've heard about Tournament of Chivalry and we keep, we in the East keep trying to uh, mimic it, but uh, talk about what it is. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a misnomer because there's no tournament. There's no competition. Um, it's like I said, I mean, we, we usually it's a big field. Um, tents set up all around it, pavilions, you know, day shades, whatever. And the Knights just go out and hold the field. And there's, we break it up now into like here over in this section, it's three, you know, three rounds crown level fight, go there, bring your best fight. You know, then there's a training area where if you want to learn a particular technique or you, you just want to, to have some passes with a particular night and go as long as that night wants to go, you can do that. Um, and then there is a, uh, what's, what's the, William, help me out here. Win Fang, you help me out. So here. yeah, go ahead, William. I was just going to say the crown list is one fight all in no instruction period. If yeah, the okay. can't, if the unbelt wins, the knight is supposed to take them to another knight in the crown list. If they lose, they go to the end of the line. Then there's three spars, and then there's a training list. But I was going right. to say I would be really interested because Win Fang is one of the knights that probably really got to benefit from this as a unbelt more. I mean, we never there was no TOC when I before I was a knight, and certainly not Dog who got knighted quite a few years before me. So, what was your impression of it, Win Fang? Yeah, so the TOC was like a dream come true, essentially as an unbelt, because I went there and all the knights were there. Um, you know, there would be 20, 30, 40 knights, and they would be spread out into three different lists. The, the knights that were looking to, to make sure that they were on their game for crown were in the crown list. The knights that were there to just kind of spar and kind of guide people and help, you know, kind of understand where they're at. They were in the three and out. Um, that's where they just spar three times. And then, and then you go out and you come back in, go in the line, come back in. And then if you like had something that you wanted to work on with a knight, um, you could ask them to go over to the training list and they would sit there and train with you. You know, you need to learn how to throw that, that Mullinay or that flat snapper or the wrap, whatever it is, you could go over there. Um, and it, you know, I took advantage of all three of those as I was coming up. Um, there were times that I would go and I, I, I distinctly remember going to William, learning his rap shot, you know, cause he's got this really nice rap shot standing up straight and wham, hits me in the thigh. And I was like, how in the hell is he doing that? <laughs> so he taught me that going into the sparring list was a really great one because I could go and hit different nights. Any night that was out there, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go fight Michael Akuin, or I'm going to go fight, you know, Ron Valder, I'm going to go fight all these different guys and I get three passes with them and I can either you know, do really great or do really bad, but they might give me a little bit of advice and then I go back in the line. And then when I was feeling really good, I'd go over into the crown list and let me see how many nights I can beat in a row. Um, and for me, that was amazing as an unbelt because it allowed me to test myself at different skill levels that were what I needed instead of going out there and like saying, okay, I'm going to fight everyone at a crown level and, you know, and just getting my butt kicked by every night out there. Um, so it's been really good like that. And then there's a part um, now we've broken it up into three seg three uh, segments. So we do that three times. And then in between those segments, we do classes now. So like if uh, Sir Drews wants to do a pole arm class, um, he'll go out there or Sir Ustad wants to teach a class on how to be able to use his weird 
goofy shield, the block headshots and stuff like that, which he does great at. Um, it, it really helps out. And we do bring in a little bit of a tournament aspect to it at the beginning. We do a uh, ladder of renown tournament. So oh, based yeah, on your award new. level, you fight a bear pit essentially of those people. And then if you win, you go up to the next award level. So starts with AOA or no award. Then it goes to our uh, order of red company, which is an AOA level award. Then it goes to our order of gold base, which is a grant level. And then it and then it tops out at the Shiv slash Royal Peers. And if some people have been lucky enough to go from all the way from the AOA level, all the way up to the, uh, the Knight level, the Shiv level, and be able to fight at that level too. Um, but that's something to just kind of get the blood warmed up for everyone to go into the, into the tournament. Initially it was, and this is good. It gives us a break because initially the Knights would just like be out there for five hours. Yeah, I was going to add, I trained for TOC. One year, <laughs> one year we fought for four and a half hours. I fought 168 passes. And I literally, the, one of the folks who rode with me to that event drove home because I couldn't keep my hands on the steering wheel <laughs> of the car. Yeah, um, I remember that it used to be when I, when I got knighted and my first TOC came up, they were like, all right, be prepared for the unbelts to just come out there and hit you with everything they've got. Cause it's, it's their, it's their time to show off to the, to the ship. And, you know, we always go back and have a meeting after that, talk about what we saw and things like that. So it's really that that's the place where you go to get your name out there to get, to build that name fame as an unbelt. So I know during this period of time, <clears throat> actually one of the little nicknames they had for me back in Murdias was a, uh, uh, PMF and that was pervy mid realm fancier. Uh, and that was a lot to do with just how well everyone fought and how well everyone trained and the, you know, the, the stuff that I was learning. So, and I got a, I I've been fortunate enough to get to go to a mid realm TOC and uh, participate as well. And it's, it is really um, a great learning experience for both the Knights and those coming to fight the Knights. But I, as a Knight myself, I think I learned so much that day from being pushed by people and trying to, you know, work through everything. So it's just great all the way around. It's a great prowess uh, razor. Um, so we mentioned the Dukes and, you know, we know that there was uh, a lot of rains, uh, one by third, fourth, fifth, sixth timers during this period uh are there any non-royal standouts um you know guys who maybe weren't fighting in crown or maybe only one you know their their county during this period who really stood out uh we need to kind of wrap up the 2000s if we're ever going to make it through tonight so um who stands out that maybe wasn't a royal or you know had only won the one tournament the one so for non-tournament winners gonna red boar he formed one of the big Viking households. He was the law speaker for uh, Trothheim. He went to the finals three times and he never took a crown, but he was a great fighter, a great warrior. I'm sure some of you know who I'm talking about. Um, he's one of my close friends, but he built this giant household of folks and he just never got a crown. That's who. That would be one of the people I would tell you really stood out. And yeah, don't pay. Don't play punching games with the red boar. <laughs> yeah if if you ever seen those russian slap fighting contests he would be oh one goodness. of the first guys to step up for that <laughs> what about you your grace and then oh, we'll go man. to wig thing this is, this is so we can skip the wig thing here you know let well, you think go, about it i've got two guys at the top of my uh at the top of my list so um for me i come from like the northeast ohio area so uh cleflin and so that's where I started at. And the, the two names that kind of were like on the tip of my tongue um, are Count Alaric and mm -hmm. uh, Duke, now Duke Balharic. But at the time in the 90s, when he was in the mid realm, he was just Count Balharic. Um, those were the two guys that really kind of like, they were the guys that I was following, trying to work against. Um, and they were the ones that really kind of like stood out to me as just some excellent fighters that uh, should be Dukes. You know, Balharic now is definitely a Duke, but um, you know, Alaric was one of those ones from a fighting perspective. You know, he like he just 
it amazed me fighting him. Even after I got knighted, I went and fought him and he'd been out of it for a little bit. Um, and I was just so thrilled to death that I could even hit him now. So uh, that's kind of the impression that he left on me. Thank you. All right, now you're on the spot, Doug. Well, Eric's definitely one of those guys who, who because he, his, his style is reminiscent of the Cleflin style, but he's not a big guy. So he's fighting with, with talent and skill. He's not, you know, he, he doesn't bring a lot of, of physicality to the fight. He's just extremely efficient. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, guys like Ish were, are, yeah. is still a contender um was uh, oh yeah, ish fan okay <laughs> uh yeah he was he was all over the place in the 2000s so there were two other names that i thought of um as i was thinking about this uh, so there's also there was my knight sir rucker or count rucker so i remember hearing he was you know when i started he was like one of the one of the unbelts that everyone was like, oh my God, there's Rucker, you know, and people were worried about fighting him. And then the other one was uh, Sir Jocelyn. Um, you know, she got to the finals of the Crown Tournament in 07 with uh, with Luter, and that was the second Crown Tournament I ever got a chance to see uh, in person. And I just I was floored to watch it, and it was it was an amazing Crown Tournament, and her performance that day was uh, was phenomenal. All right. So to wrap up uh, this decade, we back to my favorite game. Who won? Uh, who won the decade? So this time we're going to start with Wink, Wink Thing. Oh, who won the who won the decade? Um, oh, man, that, that's a hard one because Bronis and Ori won. I already called out Edmund and Dog for the 90s, but I'd have to say for the, the, the 2000s, I'm just going to put it as a group of people, the Vikings, the all the Viking households. Um, we had like Luder, Uller, uh, Gunnar, uh, Brander. Brander. Um, they, they kind of win the decade because they actually, they're the ones that kind of changed. When I came in, 14th century was real hot. And then by the end of the 2000s, everyone's wearing Lamellar. Everyone's a Viking. Everyone's wearing baggy pants and tunics. Yeah, you know, so I, I'd say they're the ones that won the decade. We we joked a little bit about, oh, you can't win crown if your name doesn't end in R. Sorry. It's <laughs> all right, Doc. Well, I mean, uh, I could go you... through your little list, but that's mostly true during this period. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and Winving's right. And there were a couple uh wasn't wasn't Kellogg's first reign in the two thousands? No, twenty thirteen. His first reign? Yeah. Was it? Okay. Well, see, it all blurs together for me. But yeah, definitely a lot of the Ohio and Kentucky guys were dominating crown lists, certainly, in that period. So. All right. William, any thoughts on that? Who won the decade? So, uh, for... Ron Valder gets his duchy and goes on, you know, is still considered widely to be one of the really great fighters. But Ike Brander, who had taken a long hiatus from the SCA because we knew him in the 80s and 90s, he was Theodric von Rostock, a good 14th century German, 14th to 15th late period. And we all looked up to Theo because he was way out at the head of the pack. And he comes back and reinvents himself as Ike Brander forms this giant Viking household group. So those would have been my two. And yeah, they're both Vikings. So <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> all I, right. Uh, well, I, always teased, I teased all those guys about barbarians tracking mud through our palaces in the mid realm. So thank you guys for sharing that. And, uh, you know, we've got a decade to go. So let's uh, go ahead and just sort of herald in the 2010s. And honestly, I don't know. I was still listening to music from the 2000s and the 90s. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what, what uh, music I'd used to bump us into the 2010s. Um, but, uh, you know, 
people who got their duchy during this period, uh, Uller won his duchy, uh, uh, Ike Brander uh, won his, and then Cameron of Beckenham and Kella all, you know, kind of ascended to their leaves during this period. But, you know, certainly as we've discussed earlier, there's a lot more going on than just, you know, who won strawberry leaves. One so, interesting thing about the 20, we're talking about the 2010s now, Your Grace? We, we are, yes. Okay. So just one interesting statistic was the amount of knights. So from the previous decade, uh, the number of uh, knights, uh, chivalry made was 62 in the 2000s. So the 2010s, it's 58. But what was really interesting to me in the stats is the max years. This is sort of like the Veterans Committee year. There are an inordinate number of people who get knighted. If we look at A to A, AOA to, uh, to, to patent, mm -hmm. who are more than 20 years, including one that's third, almost 32 years. And that, that just struck me as interesting that a lot of folks like got it done finally after these really long periods of time. Any thoughts on why? I mean, was it really sort of a they they did step up or they hit something or does does yeah. the orders kind of change and kind of grow into a different understanding of, you know, what they believe, um, you know, makes a, a peer? So for a couple of those folks, it was like they had all been on the periphery, I think, for a long time. And, you know, we're all nights on this call. You got to knuckle down and put in that three or four hard years no matter how, how good you are, if you just aren't that you gotta, you gotta break above that water. You gotta get above that water and be seen, uh, not just be seen, but you gotta, you gotta get your prowess up there. And a number of those folks, at least I'll tell you, cause my squire was one of them and he hurt his knee had had surgery and realized if he didn't get it done, his window was going to close, got his knee fixed. There are four nights in that time who got knee injuries, got their knees fixed and got on the horse and got it done. Admirable. I, I agree. Yeah, I think some of them had to, you know, work through some of the political things that they had done in the past. Um, that was another one too. Um, but you know, I. But the, I think to the on the other side though is that it it didn't mean that everyone was having to be twenty plus years to get knighted. We were still having people knighted from a ward of arms to shiv, and five, six years, seven years. I, I was a, I think I was a seven year that we had, was that Havard? Havard was three years. Havard, yeah. did, uh, Cameron was this, so I did shortest and longest. Cameron was 3.2 years from AOA to knighthood in the 2010s. Yeah. And in that time he earned his, uh, a, a county too. <laughs> so, and Havard, uh, uh, one of Duke Bronis squires was four years. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it wasn't that it was all you had to, you had to be in for a long time and you had to do everything there. There were still people that were coming in and they were pumped. They were, they knew what they wanted to do. They, we had really good pro tour that they could follow and they could go around and do that stuff and they could get, they could get elevated. Um, it, it, for me personally, I had a couple year gap where I had to do more stuff for work. I was traveling for work. I got married, had two kids. And then after the, the kids were old enough and my wife gave me the thumbs up, I was like, all right, I'm going to hit this hard. And then within a matter of a few years after that, I, I got elevated. So um, definitely, you know, the order didn't hold, you know, time against people um, in this time period, I think. I was going to say, when it came to hitting it hard, you were the guy. I looked for you at every TOC while you were coming on. Nobody came harder than, than Wig Thane. Nobody. And it was fun. You know, I kept wondering if he was just going to kick the hell out of me. But I would go and fight him because it was just, you know, it was good. And with our TOC and the culture had really come along. So the fighters knew about it. And, you know, in the early days of TOC, it was kind of like, what's this weird thing? But by the 2010s, it's a very mature activity. Everybody knows about it. Everybody plans for it, and they come from all over the kingdom. And uh, you know, and when you when you got there, it was uh, 
it was it was good your nighting was great and uh but it was uh you know that but people knew what they had to do i think you know and even some of the let's call them the long timers who maybe had dallied around you know we all know those kind of fighters right good solid fighters good stick you know if they they, they usually end up in your kingdom's grant level order and they never make it out and that's not bad necessarily but i think that the culture helped promote some of those folks finally felt like you know maybe their lives were in order enough that they could go just go after it because they saw these young guys coming on and 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 everybody helped everybody so i think that was cool about the 2010s for sure yeah there was a there was a crew that i would ride out with all the time you know me uh, Sir Thorin, Sir Sirius um, will go to these events and just be like, okay, we're here to kick butt and take names, you know, and, you know, always polite about it, but, you know, trying, <laughs> but we weren't, we weren't letting anything less uh, lay out there in the field. There's a, a lot of new names uh, during this period, but I, I think one of the things that I find remarkable is how uh, the longevity of, of some fighters, you know, is still there and and you know and i don't just mean you know that ron valder wins again dog wins again at some point edmund wins again at some point during this period uh you know those are you know truly outstanding high you know super high tier fighters and you know with a little bit of maintenance you're able to continue to fight well into your 40s and 50s and hopefully and beyond so it's really neat to see those names but like william you win your crown list during this period also and you're you know, you're not a, necessarily a spring chicken. Uh, you know, you've been around for a long time. You've been competing for a long time, but you know, you get, you finally get your, uh, your crown victory through here. Uh, it's just some, someone, if you would speak to the, the, how interesting it is, with, even with all the new blood and their ability to step up and rise up. Um, it felt like to me, uh, maybe because it's personal that, older fighters were maintaining themselves in ways that they hadn't been able to in previous decades and, and were able to continue to fight at a very high level uh, as they, as they got into their forties and fifties. Yeah. Uh, I trained hard for that. Crown. I had no expectation. We had, I had finaled twice. I finaled against Tarquin in 95 and I filed finaled against Valharic in 2000, 1999, 2001, 2003, I think was their reign. And my wife wanted to go pursue her laurel. And she had certainly supported me. I mean, certainly all of us fighters have probably had this experience, right? And mm -hmm. so she said, I wanna do this thing. And I said, I put everything on the shelf. And we took 13 years, 26 crown attorneys, we didn't compete. And out of the blue, Edmund said, why don't you put a letter in? I'm 51, I'm still in great fighting trim and the style I fight is not hard on my body purposefully. Um, a gift from my night from Comar was to not have a style that destroys you physically. And Edmund asked her if she would, we would put in a letter and she said, yes. And I was like, what, who, who are you? And we went and fought. I trained 10 weeks brutally hard. And I took the last two weeks off to make sure I was in shape and it was a great tournament. And, uh, I think, and I'm 56, I'll be 57 in June. And I expect to be competitive in crown for another 10 years. I'm sure as heck going to try and get one more. And uh, I got to beat that guy and maybe both of these guys if Wen Fang decides he's going to get into it. But uh, also the availability of healthcare things like chiropractic and, you know, just being able to, there's so much more knowledge out there about how to take care of your joint. I mean, look at the, somebody posted a question in Scott Coach's corner about how do you deal with golf elbow? And there's just so much more information available. Um, a, a king from Glenaubin helped me, Lorik helped me get my elbow sorted out and he knew stuff I'd never even heard of. You know, there's so much more information and the ability to communicate with people to help us keep ourselves. And maybe, just maybe we are a teensy bit smarter than we were in our twenties. What about you, uh, Doug? What, what do you owe your longevity to? Well, kind of like what, I didn't have someone train me to, to not abuse my body when I'm fighting, but I kind of figured it out fairly early And my styles. Our styles are not identical by any means, but they're both, they both have a high level of energy conservation built into the style. Um, I've always fought, tried to fight more efficiently and listen to my body when it's, when it complains and say, Oh, you better stop doing that. 
pain is your body's way of saying, <laughs> stop that. <laughs> so, and um, as far as I won my, the last crown I won was 2012. That was my, my seventh. And uh, I don't, I don't know how many times I was in the finals after that between now, but I, I was in the finals, the last three of the last three of the last, of the last four crown tournaments I fought in, I was in the finals in three of them, mm-hmm. yeah. but, but I think for me, it's as far as going into crown tournaments, I fought in, I can say with some confidence that I've fought in more crown tournaments in this kingdom than anyone else. And that's an advantage going in that I'm not, I'm not hyped in crown tournament. Crown tournament isn't, isn't scary. I'm not worried about how I'm going to do or, sure, you know, and I'm okay with winning. I'm okay with losing because I've lost more, <laughs> way more than I've won. But I think that there's a, a psychological, if I've got any advantage in crown tournament, that's it. It's the psychological advantage of knowing what i'm doing here and right. having done it enough times that it's just another crown tournament for the record duke dog is seven times king 15 times to the finals in total and when anybody says what do i need to be doing in crown i say go talk to dog that's what i did and while i have not fought in anywhere near the number of crowns dog is always quick to point out that he's fought in more crowns than anybody else but 15 <laughs> finals 15 crown tournament finals if i need advice on crown i ask him there's just there's no one who has more experience there to lend you and dog and i have trained together over a lot of years we talk a lot about training and i you know that's just something that's wonderful for me and uh maybe i have to fight him in the next crown maybe i don't we all know how crowns go <laughs> You just never know. And I, I was fully the crown I won. He was the guy I was expecting I had to go through. And then he wasn't in that tournament. And it was like, huh, you know. <laughs> it's almost anticlimactic. You don't get to fight the big boss on the last level. Best bragging rights. <laughs> so looking away from crown for a minute, who are some of the folks during this era that we should be thinking about that uh, aren't on that list of uh, Strawberry leaf winners. Well, I, I'll I'll go. Kellick is somebody who could win whenever he f- desires to win. I he was finals against Uller. Um, that I, I would have absolutely bet the other way. Uh, but uh, those were very those were good fights. Um, I know that Uller wanted to win another one with the circumstances after covid uh and, and us being in lockdown he wanted to be there as a as a experienced experienced king coming out of covid um but uh yeah kellick is is somebody who will f- will fight anybody and can fight anybody at any level so i i put him up there he hasn't got his dutch or yes he does have his dutchy now but, yeah he's, he's got his dutchy but early early on he did not and yeah, he's been good for a long time for sure yeah, so strong someone else is uh seto um seto you know he just got knighted towards the middle of just right before me in 2015 and won his crown tournament in 2019 um and that's the you know that's the only one that he's he's won but I mean, he's with everything that he's doing and his the physicality that he has. I mean, he's uh, just you know someone who should should be getting back in the crown and you know trying to earn those those leaves for him for him and his lady. I think we would be remiss when we talk about the 2010s if we don't mention Sasha St. Martin. Um, so everybody knows Sasha. Everybody yeah. everywhere knows this gentleman, and. Um, I, you know, we weren't friends for a very long time and then some things changed and he came up to a gathering event and made the effort, I think, to kind of meet some of us. And we all sat around talking until way too late in the kitchen at Valeric's house like Dog and I do every year. Somebody usually has to tell us, guys, it's six in the morning. Are you going to bed? Uh, hell, at this point, we're not going to bother. 
but really that that guy he really he really grew and i was really happy for his knighting and his his skill with sword has been there i mean 10 15 years i can't remember a time when sasha wasn't good but now he's uh you know he grew in the rest of the part that we like to see i think everybody does in the order and his knighting was a, was a joy and many knights from some surrounding kingdoms visited that and uh, his he's got three little girls that are getting a little older and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing some of him, you know, maybe the 2020s will be a, a big step up for him but, uh, you know, in terms of guys who could be 80% of the chivalry who weren't knights and then got knighted Sasha St. Martin, and he's a great guy now I, I really enjoy his company. You know, uh, his name brings up something that we were talking about earlier about how long it was taking. We touched it slightly about, you know, the period of, of guys getting knighted after 20 years and but still getting some still coming in in the four, five, six year range. But but guys who are getting their 20th year under their belt before they got knighted. And I think that there may have been. I mean, I, I saw it I, when I when I was knighted, I was uh, 25. And um, 25, 24, 24. But as the, as the average age of the society gets older, the average age of the chivalry is getting older as well. Uh, that's pretty obvious. But I think there's a, it may even be unconscious, but we're looking, we might be looking as we get older, we, as we gather what little wisdom we might have over the years, we are looking for a little more seasoning in guys who we bring into the order because we recognize the responsibility that comes along with that. And we want somebody who's going to live up to that responsibility and in some ways stick around because there's dues you pay before you're knighted. And then there's the dues you pay after you're knighted. And I, and I think it, it's, as we get older, we look, for that in our candidates is that is that guy going to stick around it's not just well he beat me so he's in it's, it's right. no longer that it's what's he going to do for the society what's he going to bring to the order and that may extend guys careers before they're knighted a little bit than more than it used to that's such a delicate dance to make sure that we're you know the orders everywhere are uh, getting the right amount of seasoning, you know, so that, you know, you feel really good about, you know, recommending to the crown that this person be elevated. And also you've got to remember that if you wish to attract new and young people, new and young people have to be, they, they have to have the opportunity to get their patents when they deserve them as soon as they deserve them. It's a weird, hard dance to get that right. But, you know, I mean, who wants to join a club that you got to be in 15 years before you can be recognized to be really good. So it, it's, it's hard. And, yeah. you know, everyone struggles with that. I think every kingdom struggles with that a little bit. The other thing that I think is really a delicate balance there is making sure that we're not just looking for ourselves as the orders age. Uh, it's really important that we don't just say, oh, these are the people that are like us that we want to see brought in. No, the people who are 20 years younger than us are not like us. They listen to different music, going back to Elanon's <laughs> point of not knowing what to kick us off with. Um, and they're doing things differently, but that doesn't mean necessarily that the way that they're doing it is not nightly. And that has been a struggle that I personally have gone through a lot. I remember being in a chivalry meeting and uh, my knight was complaining about the prowess of some candidates. And I said, oh, so he, he can't beat you, your grace. Uh, he just isn't, isn't up to your level, your grace. Well, I, neither are most of us. <laughs> you know, that's a really good point that, that you made, Brandon, that we have to think more about like what we were when we got knighted. I was 29 years old. And if, if 29 year old me who, who had a lot of juice had to fight 56 year old me, I would stomp that guy. It's not a question, but that's not the point. The 29 year old me was in the eyes of that crown worthy. And I need to dial my age lenses back a little so that I'm not looking for somebody, like you said, not just who's like me, but that 
at my level of skill. I've had a lifetime and I've been in this sport since I was 15 years old. I don't know anything else. I suck at every sport on planet earth, except this one. Hmm. Um, let me, uh, let's, let's move us real quickly into the sort of the last bit of, uh, of talking about the decade and that's the, the training aspect. Um, what, um, what, what, what changed significantly during this period? And I know we were talking about there being more and more in the previous decade of an opportunity to digitally and virtually learn. But I think it's also taken off a bit more, um, you know, from, from the period of, of the pain bank and uh, Legio Draconis, you know, now we've got uh, streaming videos and, uh, and such. And of course the pandemic certainly didn't accelerated some of that, but I think there was more of it all the time. I mean, a number of mid realm nights were famous at this period for their videos. I was going to say, you know, when you're talking about digital and not digital, a couple things did happen in the 2010s, adult swim, which is just a big fight practice with tons and tons of instruction. What's the, uh, what's the one out in, in tears? Uh, is that sport of Kings? That became right. a really big deal. And isn't there one down in um, Trimaris? Is that Duke University? They have Duke U and Trimaris, yeah. And I mean, people get on planes to go to these things and uh, or drive long, you know, long ways. And uh, that has really helped. That was one of the things. And then, of course, the digital. But those were a couple of like physical events that, you know, I go, I drive it's, it's I would say, yeah, I guess Adult Swim is moderately close for me. It's only seven and a half hours away. And I take a crew to that event because there's so much to learn. You get to fight people you never see. Yeah, or you or you're fighting them on the opposite side of a battlefield, and you don't really have time to fight them. You you either hit them and knock them down, or you're spending too much time with them. So, yeah, it's a it's a real it's really nice to go there and and get a chance to fight. I've only been once, but uh, I I'm planning to go again when I can. Yeah, the adult swim's been really fun for me because that's Brendan. That's the first time I got to fight you was an adult swim. Um, I've fought so many East guys there. It's been like, it's, it's awesome. So and now I make the trip out to hundred minute war just about every year, just because it's been such a great time, great experience with you guys, but, you know, kind of some of the stuff from a, from a training perspective though, I, I think, you know, back to your question, Alan, was the, the, the YouTube really kind of became big in the 2010s. And so with us recording video and the fact that now we've got mobile devices that can record video so easily and frequently. Um, I know me personally, I, for a while there, when I was coming up, I was posting video like crazy onto YouTube. Um, I've got probably about two, 300 videos of just fight practices uh, up there. Um, and even now other people local to me have started picking it up. My wife started picking it up too, doing streaming our, our fight practices and, you know, the people up in uh, Michigan at Roaring Waste, Dark Yard, they're doing it too. Um, so it, it's been really helpful. People out in uh, Midlands, out in Chicagoland, you know, they were doing it uh, as well before the pandemic hit. Um, so that's been helpful. And I think it really, like, a, like what happened in the 2000s, that evolution of just kind of getting more clinical with the education of fighting and the training of fighting you know, understanding, you know, like, like dog and William were saying earlier about understanding about our bodies and how they work and how they react and how to prevent injuries, you know, so much more of that stuff is being shared. Um, so it's just that evolution of what started in the, the 2000s, that free uh, sharing of information uh, just amongst the entire group has been really helpful. All right. So with just a couple minutes left, Let's do it one more time. The 2010s to present, who won? I'm gonna start with uh, Dog. Oh, you got me. Um, 2010s. Well, we end. We we lost one year of the 2010s, but well, Sasha did a pretty good job, as William pointed out, in the 2010s final and crown against me to his detriment but uh <laughs> uh 
um, really did kind of come into his own and, and traveled outside of his group and broke away from his, his household a little bit to, to fight a, a, in a wider range of, of places. Um, I'm, I, try, I tend to think in terms of regions and Sasha's Indiana. Um, um, we didn't really have, a, a, I can't think of anybody in Michigan who was who really jumped out in the 20, in the 2010s that wasn't already out there. Um, and, and William would be better off talking about Ohio than I would certainly in Winfang both. So Sasha was really the one that, that everybody talked about him, but I don't think I had ever fought him before that crown tournament that he and I fought. Um, great fights, great video of him stabbing me in the belly when I thought I, I thought he was dead to rights. It's all out there and you can't hear it on the video, but I'm laughing all the way to the floor because <laughs> I, one of those things where you, you see it coming, you know, the mistake you've just made and it's too late to correct. And you just gotta, you just gotta take it like a knight and fall down <laughs> in, in all your, with all your humility piled on you. <laughs> all right. Uh, wing thing. Yeah. So I, I've got two names really that kind of stick out to me. Um, I didn't name Ron Valder for the 20 or the 2000s, but I'll say the 2010s though. Ron Valder definitely was there because I think that's where especially with the, the YouTube video sharing and his third crown win, you know, at 50 years old, um, you know, proving that he can still be competitive at that age. Um, and just the people just like watching his videos, so his video uh, fighting um, uh, the, the, his grace from the East, um, from your household brand. Kendrick. Kendrick, Kendrick. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately passed, but I mean, you know, that, that video is one of the top hit videos on my YouTube page. So, and I just can't go anywhere without hearing his name pop up. So he's one. The other one, uh, you know, is, I would say is Kellick. Um, we mentioned that how he's just someone that'll fight anyone and everyone. And he got knighted in right when I started. Um, and so he was one of those guys that I kept watching and through the 2010s, you know, he was in crown tournaments and just pushing himself, pushing himself and eventually got his, his two crowns in. Um, and everything I've seen, you know, he's one of the most loved and respected, you know, guys in the mid realm. So everywhere, I, I, I can't think of anyone everywhere. Who's yeah. Thing about him. So those are the two guys for me. Then the 2010s, Sasha is a great fight, um, but he got knighted in 2020. So he's just outside of the 2010s. All right, William, to close this out. I'm going to go a different tack. Instead of talking about an Avenger, if, if, uh, if the 2000s was the era of the Vikings and Trotheim would be that entity, the 2010s, it's the Von Atzingers. Tons of them get knighted. Their household rises to great prominence in the Middle Kingdom, even though Vitus, the gentleman who found Vitus von Atzinger, who founded the household, drops away. A lot of them get knighted. They get a lot of peers across the board. But all those fighters really driving 14th century back to the forefront. Um, and all of them are, are great, even those that aren't competing in crown. And uh, I won't be surprised if maybe we see some crowns come out of that household here coming on in the 20, 2020s. But I like the Von Atzingers as just being the every household. They make guard for the royals. They fight. They just do everything. And they really stand out in my mind as being very influential in that period of time. Neat. All right. I'm going to actually give a, a an honorary vote or a, a non non-counting vote. I'd like to sort of shout out to uh, a couple of uh, mid-realm gentlemen. Uh, first, uh, His Majesty Uller, who, you know, after a number of years came back and won and fought, and he's always been just an outstanding fighter. Uh, his Kung Fu background, uh, you know, really helps him in a lot of different weapon styles, but he also just has the mind of a warrior and really, really can approach a lot of fighting that way. I think that it's really neat uh, that after uh, a few years away from uh, reigning, uh, Felix 
you know, came back and, and fought so well and, and did such a great job. And then I just, I have to give a special shout out because I, you know, I really don't think we talked about him enough because of his footprint in, in your kingdom's history throughout all these, you know, so many decades now, but his grace Edmund has just a presence that, I mean, he's a large man, but his presence within, uh, you know, from an outsider looking in at your kingdom just seems so large and so, so, uh, you know, his, his uh, ability to keep coming back decade after decade and being competitive and reinvent himself and, you know, change his kit and, and do everything. So he's always been an extremely impressive figure uh, in your kingdom. And we, uh, Brent and I would very much like to thank you three gentlemen for your time uh, to be able to share with us so much history and, and information and entertainment about the mid realm. Uh, just a, a great kingdom that's influenced well outside your own kingdom and well outside your borders. Uh, thank you, your grace dog. Thank you, Count William. And thank you, Sir Wigthane. Uh, you've been fantastic. Um, a real quick programming note. Next week, the uh, Coach's Corner is an elephant in the room, marshalling. Do we even need it? Uh, Brendan, take us out of here. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all again. Uh, it's been a whole lot of fun. Uh, as uh, your annual eternal rival, getting to peer into your kingdom has been... Uh, spectacular for me uh and i've really loved it and elanon uh it's great doing this with you and uh special thanks to our producer sir theo Edward, uh who makes this run every week thanks y'all have a great night thank you thank you, thank you. love love your channel thanks for having <laughs> me